I just like to remind everybody that food banks were established 30 years ago in British Columbia as a temporary measure. And as Marilyn will say, they're probably busier now than they have ever been. And in my book, and I suspect in most people's book, 30 years is not temporary. Unfortunately, it has become part of the fabric almost of our society that people are forced to rely on food banks here in British Columbia, a very rich province. I'm with Raise the Rates. We're the people who issued the challenge to all the MLAs in British Columbia to step forward and spend a month living on welfare. And we need to look at ways so we can reduce people's reliance on food banks. That's in no way to diminish the work that the food banks do here in Surrey and the rest of British Columbia. And I'm sure most of the people who are involved in food banks would prefer a province well, they could do other things to help humanity. But unfortunately, they now are a necessity. People need them to get by, to feed their children. And they're filling a gap in our society created by poverty, by poverty wages, by poverty welfare, by poverty pensions. And people need them now. But we want to look to a society where people don't have to get by on food banks, which is why Raise the Rates is campaigning as part of your group's experience, to raise welfare, to raise the minimum wage, so people can live in dignity. One of our, our dreams is that people will have justice so that they will no longer have to rely on charity. So I'd like to ask Marilyn to come up and say a few words. Marilyn's the executive director of Surrey Food Bank. And thank you again, Marilyn. You're welcome, um, This is a very, uh, a man I admire very much. This is a man who has, this morning, had firsthand the experience of what it means to come to a food bank and to receive what we have. We give what we get, we give what we have, we give what we can afford to buy. I, I accepted the challenge <laughs> issued by Raise the Rates to tell a story. The powerful story of half a million people of BC living in poverty. Yeah. As a father of two young children, it's hard for me to imagine that we have 137,000 children living in poverty in this beautiful province of British Columbia. It is hard for me to believe that we have 70,000 people visiting food bank every month, and one third of them are children. It's hard for me to believe that the gap between the rich and the poor has widened to the point that the top 10% BC families are now making significantly more than the entire 50% families at the bottom. As Marilyn said at the beginning, imagine for a second that 30 years ago, we said that we are going to open the food bank and it is only a temporary uh, solution. And after 30 years, what we saw, there are more and more and more food banks in this province opening. These brown and blue dots, dots, they are not dots, they are human beings. They are human beings living in this city, in every part of this city. And poverty is everywhere, not limited to any neighborhood. This map is, is a very powerful uh, testament of that reality. And I don't know if anybody could do, or has done a map of British Columbia. And again, you would see the same pattern, that it's not just pockets of Wally, the downtown east side, or other poor neighborhoods. You would find it in every community in British Columbia, in resource towns in the north, 
in the Okanagan, in the interior, on Vancouver Island, and all across the Lower Mainland, people are struggling in poverty. And many of them, as the group says, are hidden from us. So I think that image of Maryland's map is, again, a powerful indication. So as long as they can. So the figures are half a million in poverty. You know, and some of, a lot of them, you wouldn't know who they were. Uh, we have half a million people in this province who live below the uh, poverty line, half a million. Out of that, about 63% people are actually working. And usually what the, the, uh, you hear sometimes from outside is that these people don't want to work. There's a myth out there that people don't want to work. But 63%, uh, which is 300, about 320,000 people are now working, but they are not making enough money to live a life of dignity and, and respect. And then we have about 180,000 people on welfare. And there are significant people on welfare because, uh, because, uh, because of bad economy. When economy goes down, the people are laid off, and then people basically go on EI, and then they end up being on welfare because uh, if they can't find job because of bad economy, that happens. And there are there is a significant population of people who are who, who are who have disability. Mm -hmm. And uh, in any society, any civilized society, we have to support the most vulnerable people who are in that situation. So there are a lot of myths out there that uh, you know people don't want to work, but I found completely the opposite. This is what Tedrick was doing this morning. In these boxes, we have no idea what's here. They're all donated from food drives, yeah. events, and so what he was doing was helping to try to serve mm -hmm. because we can't put him onto the line, into the hamper, until we know what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have enough soup that we could give two or three soups in a hamper. Maybe we won't have enough. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I want to tell you about, about your uh, uh, program for pregnant women and for babies. Yeah, we have uh, about 250 babies coming to the food bank every week. And we hate to think that a child is going hungry. So we made a commitment a number of years ago that we would give a family a full week of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Or if you're pregnant, you'll receive a full hamper every week. The wonderful thing is when a family comes, they know they get a full week of nutrition for that baby. So they'll get the formula, they'll get the jarred baby food, the cereal, a few diapers. And we're very, very, very confident that families without that would really be compromised to feed a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so We're spending so much money on baby food if it's not donated, and formula is expensive. I'll show you something over here, and this will give you a good idea. Sorry, Stephen. Thanks. If you look up there, you see that skid of um, cans in the gold, just in the gold, the skid? That is baby formula. That is worth $10,000. Just that one skid of the tins, not, not the purple ones, but on the, the right. one underneath. This one on the right. yeah. That is worth $10,000. We buy one of those every six to eight weeks to make sure that we've got enough to feed the babies. One year is, it, is what we call our toddler tote, but this is the room where our grandmas come, and you can see it's happy and it's got Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. And let me go in and I'll pull out what we would give a mom. So if you're... If you're coming for baby formula, you would get this. And this would be a full week of formula. So you've got enough milk to feed your baby. If they're old enough, they might get a, ba a box of cereal, cereal to go with it. And then for your little one, when they turn six to eight months, they would get a bag of jars of fruit, 
pudding, bananas, anything that's appropriate for that age group. Carrots, that's great. And then we would add for you. diapers for your baby so they would take home every week so you've got what your baby needs to keep you going maybe not enough diapers but we don't buy diapers oh and then we'd add a few wipes so your baby's got some wipes there is a myth out there the people who use food bank they live one corner of the city I found today that myth is wrong people who come here come from every part of the city, including the most wealthy area of the city, Panorama and Morgan Creek. That's what I found. So that myth is wrong. There is also a myth out there, the people who use food bank, they are the people who don't want to work. And I found today that that myth is wrong. I found today that 10% people who come here, they're actually working today. They're actually working today, but they cannot put the food at the table for their children with the salary they make every month. I found today that about 10% people who come here are our seniors who dedicated their entire life uh, for this country to build this beautiful country for us and our future generations. They come here because they are on fixed income and they cannot uh, live a life of dignity and the respect with that money they receive under the pension. I also saw today that one third of people who come here, they are children. Mm -hmm. They are children, they are very vulnerable children who has to come here. And I, I cannot imagine for a second, I cannot imagine for a second a mother who come here with her children and stand in, in that line to receive a hamper. It is very, very difficult position to be in for someone, and particularly a mother. So I want to say thank you to Marilyn and all the staff members I've been working with since this morning and all the other people who work in the province helping the most needy people to give them the hamper and the food uh, to, to basically uh, survive and, and live their life uh, in this province. But. And the stories I'm hearing are way more powerful than a uh, award-winning Hollywood movie. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm seeing. We have clearly, we have failed to stop the, the growing poverty. Clearly, we have failed to put brakes on the growing poverty. We have to do something. And that's why I'm trying to tell that story to the people of British Columbia. And I have a... I do have a goal, I do have a dream. My goal is that we have to start somewhere. We cannot afford not to do anything. We cannot live with the status quo, uh, what we have in the province today. We have to take actions. We have to show leadership in this province, and we have to start somewhere. And in my opinion, the starting point is to build a comprehensive uh, poverty reduction plan with clear targets and timelines. Because there are a lot of stereotyping and myths out there mm -hmm. which are basically wrong, not the reality.